Hello, and welcome virtually to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Christopher Sands, and I'm director of the Canada Institute at the Wilson Center. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here today with our two ambassadors um, to, for a discussion of the roadmap, the Biden-Trudeau agenda for a renewed U.S.-Canada partnership. Nothing could be more central to this relationship between these two countries. And, uh, and yet at the same time, it doesn't get the headlines because all of the hard work of the roadmap is being performed under the shadow of world events like the Russian invasion of Ukraine and beyond. So we wanna focus on the long run, how the relationship is going and how the roadmap is evolving. Our speakers today do not really need an introduction to anyone who is tuning in, but I'm going to introduce them anyway. Ambassador Kirsten Hillman is an attorney uh, and a public servant with more than 25 years working with the government of Canada, primarily in the trade space. She was sent to Washington in, in 2017 and served from 2017 to 2019 as Canada's deputy ambassador here in Washington. And then in March of 2020, elevated to be Canada's first female ambassador in Washington and has served with great distinction in Washington ever since. It's great to have you here, Ambassador Hillman. Ambassador David Cohen is also an attorney and was a business leader for more than 25 years. On November 2nd, 2021, the Senate uh, confirmed him unanimously to serve as our ambassador in uh, in. Ottawa, and I have to say, I don't think there have been very many unanimous votes in the Senate lately, so uh, kudos to you, sir, for that. Um, he was he presented his credentials on December 7th, 2021, to Governor General Mary Simon, and immediately inherited the roadmap agenda, which was already underway. So because he's had less time on the file, no disrespect, I'm going to turn to Ambassador Hillman uh, to open us up for a discussion of how we're doing on the roadmap. Over to you, Ambassador Hillman. Thanks very, very much, Chris. And hello, David. Great to see you and uh, very nice to have an opportunity to talk about this today. Um, I, and, I, and I look forward to jumping in and, and talking about the roadmap. But if I, if I may, Chris, I do think just as you did, it's really important to just pause for a moment and uh, acknowledge the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. As you know, Canada and the U.S. are very much invested um, in one of the most productive and collaborative and mutually beneficial relationships in the world. And part of that relationship is working together to promote uh, democracy um, at home and around the world. So we want to just say that um, we, in working with the United States and working together with our allies around the world are deeply uh, offended and deeply concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. Um, Canada condemns in the strongest possible terms, the Russian attack on Ukraine. It's a clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity and independence. And it's a violation of international law and the charter of the United Nations. So we do welcome um, the continued leadership that uh, the US is demonstrating along with the international community, both Canada and the US have worked really closely to coordinate an array of measures uh, to hold the Russian leadership to account. And in, including on Tuesday, while well, in Latvia, our prime minister announced uh, a multi-year renewal of Operation Assurance, which is in support of NATO in Central and Eastern Europe, we have led the referral of the situation to the International Criminal Court to investigate allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity by the Russian forces. Canada was one of the first countries to close its airspace and to close its market to um, in Russian oil. So close its airspace to Russian aircraft and our, our market to Russian oil. Um, there's a range of financial sanctions, as we all know, that are being targeted and being ratcheted up over time. Um, and of course, domestic support, both in terms of humanitarian and, um, assistance, but also military assistance and, and loans to bolster the Ukrainian economy. So, you know, we are, we are deeply engaged. We have a delegation in Europe meeting with colleagues, um, including our prime minister, our deputy prime minister, our foreign minister, our defense minister, our development minister. And as we speak, Prime Minister Trudeau and Vice President Harris are actually uh, meeting in Poland at this very moment. So uh, to, to everybody, um, I would just like to say thank you to our American partners for the close collaboration. This is exactly the kind of thing that we all need to be working together on. Um, 
So moving moving to the to the roadmap, uh, I think that you know one of the things that that the situation in Ukraine and many other more volatile situations that we have been facing as a globe, whether it's climate change, fighting COVID, um, trying to manage it, has has shown us is that you really do need to make sure as a nation that you are working with partners and countries that you can trust, uh, countries that are invested in your success, countries that share your values, and countries that'll be there for you when the chips are down. And there is no better way, I think, to explain and express the Canada-US relationship than that as partners who are deeply invested in each other's success. Just over a couple of weeks ago, we marked the one year anniversary of the roadmap for a renewed Canada US partnership. And I've said to you before, Chris, and to others, you know, I've had a hand in writing many a leader's statements uh, over the years. And this one is like no other I've ever seen. Um, it's detailed, it's comprehensive, it's not designed and should not be judged as being designed to achieve quick hits, quick fixes, quick achievements. You know, it's not a it's not an announceable or a deliverable document, but at the same time, it is not a document that is designed to be aspirational and speak in generalities. It truly is what it says it is. It's a roadmap. It's a document that articulates shared priorities, shared values, and a work plan that is meant to be implemented over time. So before I start talking a little bit about where I see some of the successes in this past year, let me just take a, a, a few minutes to, to talk about how it came to be. Um, after the election, and then after the inauguration, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau had a handful of conversations. And, you know, after the uh, uh, traditional congratulations and sort of sharing of experiences, as uh, our elected officials do, having gone through these very momentous moments, they started to compare notes on all of the challenges that were facing our two countries uh, and the world in, in a large respect at that time. Um, and then they started talking a little bit about their own policies and goals as to how they would be facing those challenges. And the more they talked, the more they realized, as, and, and, and they'd realized this a little bit before, but it became incredibly clear how much the two leaders had in common, not only in terms of what they were facing in the world, but in terms of the ways in which they wanted to be addressing them. So in the days following the inauguration of, of uh, President Biden, we worked with the White House to map out these issues and to put against them sort of our policy objectives and approaches towards dealing with them. And the commonalities were and continue to be extensive from taking a science-based approach towards fighting COVID, promoting economic recovery focused on those who have been the hardest hit by the pandemic, addressing all forms of discrimination and inclusion, including systemic racism, taking as aggressive as possible action to fight climate change, building resilient supply chains, in ensuring that we have all of the tools necessary and are supporting the tools necessary to strengthen democracy, both at home and abroad, um, you know, defending our shared continent, I could go on. So, so rather than just working on these issues side by side, the leaders decided to issue this roadmap and to try and guide our work by bringing together not only what it was we were trying to do in terms of substantive outcomes, but the values, right? It's a values document as well that talks about the shared values between these two governments. And it, therefore, and against this backdrop, the six pillars were created of fighting COVID, building back better, accelerating climate action, diversity and inclusion, um, bolstering security and defense and, uh, and building global alliances. And I think we've made a lot of progress over this last year. We're gonna to continue to deepen that cooperation. And I'll talk about some of the areas where I think we've made some important progress. Um, but it's also, it is also a partnership that evolves, right? As the world evolves and as we see, the situation globally is, is, is very much um, an ever-changing place. So let me just highlight a few specific achievements under the roadmap. COVID-19, um, you know, it's, it, it's funny, time is quite elastic, I find, in these moments. And, and if you think back a year ago, we were still deep in you know, a situation where Canadians and Americans weren't moving back and forth to each other's countries around the world. We were 
working hard to get people vaccinated. Um, we, were, we were concerned with whether there would be enough vaccinations in time. I mean, it, it was a really different moment than it is actually even today. So we did a lot of work on um, accessing vaccinations, comparing notes on the science, comparing notes on what was happening at our border. It wasn't, it wasn't perfect. There were a lot of you know, people who suffered from, from us having had to take the measures that we took on the border, but we were constantly assessing whether we had the balance right. Um, on the international stage, we worked together on our common target of vaccinating 70% of the, the global population by September of this year. Uh, we worked, of course, on all the corollary areas of the economy. Um, we advanced some work on our critical minerals action plan, which was then buttressed uh, by the leaders just this past um, fall in, in, in doubling down on supply chains and uh, the critical minerals component of that. The Canadian budget in 2021 allocated um, close to $50 million towards this critical minerals work that we're doing at home and in partnership with the US. Um, we are looking at a renewed a vision for managing our border, taking a lot of lessons that we've learned through the disruptions of the past couple of years. Uh, we started negotiations towards a science, technology and innovation agreement. Um, on climate change, Canada uh, was very, pleased with the global leadership and, and inspired by the global leadership shown by the president. And we announced an enhanced target of um, 40 to 45% reductions below 2005 levels, which was, a, which was, a, a, was building on a, a commitment we had just met. So this, this concept of not only moving towards fighting climate change, but accelerating that move. I think that the, the dynamism between our two countries and, and the, the shared priority of our two leaders has, has accelerated that, I can certainly say uh, for us. Um, we've worked on uh, diversity, in, equity and inclusion. Something that I think is kind of interesting is that Canada has been delivering um, some training sessions to US public servants, including senior officials at the White House on how we do um, gender equality assessments within our public service and how we approach those issues in our, um, in our work. Um, you know, security and defense, we have been doing an awful lot um, and we've been making some important contributions to uh, NORAD modernization and continental defense in our recent budget. I mean, I can, I, there's, there's a lot and I, I fear I may be going on for too long, but on global alliances, um, uh, yeah, let me just say something that's very personal to me because I spent an awful lot of time working on this. I was very moved when the roadmap was, um, was announced when President Biden in his remarks called out Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig by name and called, called their names out and called for their release um, in a way that I don't think had, had ever been done by another leader. And uh, it was very impactful, it sent an important message. So we're very grateful for, for their release this past fall and for you know, the president's clear and unwavering support in that as, as, and, and all of the senior members of his team. Um, we've been working very closely on the Summit of Democracy, uh, which we also think it was a, is a terrific initiative this year of action that the White House is uh, leading and Canada is making some contributions to some aspects of um, that agenda, focus in particular on the hemisphere. So, so there's a lot, uh, and I, I, I'm trying to give a flavor of every pillar, but it, I do realize it sounds a bit listy, and so I, I will maybe stop there and just say that, you know, looking ahead, um, I think a lot has been done. Uh, unfortunately, in this, in this challenging, multi-challenged world that we're in, there's still a lot to do. I think we're, we're going to continue our fight against COVID, of course, globally, but also have some really important lessons learned from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, from a borders perspective. Um, as we build our economies back in a more resilient way, I think we, we will be looking at how our partnerships work together. As I say, we have a, a Canada-US supply chain discussion that is, is, is vibrant. Um, but in addition, we want our growth to be green. You know, We want uh, to make sure that we are building our our infrastructure projects as, as is happening here in a manner that is forward facing and innovative. And I think we're doing some interesting work together on that. Um, and we'll continue to work on those in our society who, who really do continue to struggle in these, in these challenging times. So let me just close by saying um, this. 
the way I live the Canada-US relationship, which of course is what I live every day uh, in, in my functions, is that we are focused on you know, transactional issues from, of course, but over and above everything else, we are focused on our shared values, our mutual um, benefit that when one is strong, the other is strong, that by, whole, you know, by building each other up, we make each other stronger. We are focused on our shared values in the world. Um, we have made clearly, we have made important progress against specific roadmap commitments. But as we're seeing, as we do this together, what we do together is very much influenced by the events of the world. Um, and the Russia-Ukraine crisis is obviously the most prominent example of that. And what inspires me is that the fact, the Canada-US relationship, it doesn't just withstand these changes, these challenges, these upheavals. It actually strengthens and grows in the face of them. It's actually in these moments when we need to come together and deal with very, very difficult issues that we realize the degree to which we are uh, a partnership that is deeply mutually supportive and deeply positive for both of our nations. So I think that it's really important to take stock of what we've done in the roadmap. I think it's really important to see it as a, a document that expresses um, concrete goals in terms of things that we wanna get done, but also expresses our values. And that those values are transcending moments of important challenge right now, and frankly, are just coming out stronger and stronger in my view. So with that, um, I'll thank you once again, Chris, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hillman. Uh, well said, I think. Uh, let me turn to you now, Ambassador Cohen in Ottawa. So thanks very much, Chris, and thanks to everyone at the Wilson Center's Canada Institute for organizing this event to give both countries a chance to talk about the first anniversary of the roadmap for a renewed U.S.-Canada partnership. And of course, special thanks to Ambassador Kirsten Hillman for joining us this afternoon. Although we talk all the time, it's great to see you, albeit virtually. Um, Kirsten's become a great friend since I was confirmed to be the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. I tease her that she was my first meeting as Ambassador, Desig as ambassador Designee, um, and she's consistently given me terrific advice. Well, maybe with one exception. She assured me the Canadian winters weren't that bad. And you know, I come from Philadelphia. We have, we have cold weather, we have snow, but, there's, but I've learned there's cold and then there is Ottawa cold and they are not the same. So while I've been shivering a bit, Kirsten's been enjoying the relatively moderate Washington DC winter. So on a more serious note, we have just celebrated the first anniversary of the very first virtual foreign visit of the Biden administration to Canada, which the president sat, where the president sat down for a series of meetings with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Even via video teleconference, the warmth and friendship between our two leaders and our two countries were abundantly clear. More importantly, the virtual visits led to a very concrete result the roadmap for a renewed U.S.-Canada partnership. When people ask me what has been accomplished over the past year in the U.S.-Canada relationship, I always start by noting that the roadmap itself really is quite an accomplishment. It is the kind of shared, ambitious, strategic vision that could be put in place only by the closest of friends and allies. It's not an overstatement to say that the roadmap has brought the U.S.-Canada relationship to a new level of cooperation and collective purpose 
as we renew old relationships and look forward to the future. As Kirsten said, the roadmap is a truly comprehensive strategic plan. It's not just about prosperity or security or shared values. It's about all those things and more. The roadmap is organized around six pillars, combating COVID-19, building back better from the pandemic, accelerating the battle against climate change, advancing diversity and inclusion, bolstering security and defense, and building global alliances. Kirsten did a great job ticking off our successes and just to show us how aligned Canada and the United States are, I have my own set of accomplishments to tick off, many of them the same as what Kirsten ticked off, but many of them different, um, which shows you just how much work we've been able to accomplish under the purview of the roadmap. So I think all six of these pillars are important, but they're also interconnected. For example, bringing the pandemic under control and advancing diversity and inclusion really are cross-cutting priorities that cut across all of the other pillars. Unless we make progress on them, we won't get very far with the other pillars. So as I look back over the past year, I can confidently report that we have made progress. Although a lot of our work has been slowed by COVID and by other world events, and we have moved the needle in a number of consequential ways. Although sometimes people may discount process-oriented work as not being particularly substantive, we have worked very hard <clears throat> to build a foundation for our ambitions, which will enable us to deliver substantively on the promise of our renewed partnership for people in both countries in 2022 and beyond. And we've coupled that process-oriented work with a number of significant substantive outputs from our joint efforts. So let me begin with the pandemic. So tomorrow marks two years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic, two years. Last year, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau recognized the urgency of the pandemic and made it clear that fighting COVID-19 was our top priority. That's why the United States and Canada have made tough decisions, not always politically popular, to control the spread of the pandemic within our two countries and have been among the world's leaders in pursuing vaccinations for our citizens, which have proved to be the best single tool in our toolbox for combating the pandemic. But we've also become leading donors of COVID-19 vaccines globally. To date, the United States has committed over 1.2 billion, with a B, doses of vaccines and shipped over 400 million doses to 112 countries around the world, all for free with no strings attached or promises extracted. And that's not just because of our moral commitment to vaccine equity, but because it's also in our self-interest. As President Biden said to Prime Minister Trudeau last year, no one is safe uh, until all of us are safe. But we all know the pandemic hasn't just been about a virus. It's caused real economic pain around the world, including in our two countries. Worse, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted women, people of color, and indigenous communities in both the United States and Canada, and damaged small and medium enterprises on both sides of the border. In the roadmap, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau committed to building back better from the pandemic, but not just returning to the way things were before COVID. Rather, <clears throat> they committed to making sure that our economic recovery 
after COVID is inclusive and sustainable, that it strengthens the middle class and ensures Americans and Canadians have good jobs and careers. There's been real substantive progress here as well. President Biden's first year in office was the greatest year of job creation in American history, with the United States adding a record 6.6 million new jobs. When President Biden took office, the US unemployment rate was 6.2%. Now it's 3.9%. And that's the biggest single year drop in the unemployment rate in American history. We've also seen a tremendous growth in trade between our two countries. Earlier this week, we learned that US-Canada bilateral trade was up 23% in 2021 to 750 billion US dollars. That's our largest trade relationship in the world. And that's the highest it's been since 2014 and the second highest in 23 years. To put it another way, more than 2 billion US dollars in goods and services cross our border every day, creating and sustaining millions of jobs on both sides of the border. That's an incredible statistic. So yes, we have some disagreements as any family does, but we can't let our disagreements bury the lead of our incredibly strong overall relationship and the enormous economic benefits to both countries that come from that relationship. As I've said repeatedly since my arrival in Canada, we can't judge a strong partnership and friendship on, based on when we agree. We have to base it on how we handle our disagreements. And the United States and Canada have a fantastic track record of handling our disagreements and continuing to grow the pie of trade and economics between Canada and the United States. Of course, we also face some real challenges in the years ahead, and I'll call out climate change as a principal example of that. President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau understand that the health of our peoples, our economies, and our security is at stake. President Biden has wasted no time re-engaging with the international community to meet this shared challenge. The United States has re-entered the Paris Climate Accord and significantly enhanced our climate goals. The United States and Canada also led by example at the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow to accelerate global ambitions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We both have signed on to the Global Methane Pledge, where Canada again took the lead and have committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. We have underscored our commitment in the roadmap to make our societies more diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible. This is something I'm very passionate about personally, and I'm extremely proud that it plays such a central role in the roadmap. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility cut across the other pillars of the roadmap. It's pretty simple why. If we can't make progress on these issues, we're going to have a hard time bringing real prosperity to all of our people or strengthening democracy around the world. So we've had some successes already in the SME space. Just yesterday, I had a chance to meet with three women-owned businesses, two owned by women of color, by the way, who have survived the pandemic and are now building back better with some support from the government. Their stories were inspirational and it just whets my appetite to do more under this critical pillar of the roadmap. So I've been having my own conversations with government officials in Canada and the United States, with the private sector and with SMEs about trying to create an initiative in Canada 
that effectively provides a one-stop shop for SMEs, especially SMEs owned by women, people of color, and indigenous peoples. That one-stop shop would facilitate access to public and private sector financial programs and support and enable the participating SMEs to benefit from mentoring and pro bono consulting services to facilitate their recovery from the ravages of the pandemic. There are many programs like this in the United States, most sponsored by the private sector, but with full public sector partnership. And I've heard only excitement about creating similar opportunities in Canada to help us to build back better, to support SMEs, and in particular, to advance the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility elements of the, of the roadmap. President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau also agreed in the roadmap that collective security is a shared responsibility. That expression of mutual commitment a year ago has proved to be prescient as Vladimir Putin has launched a premeditated and horrified war of choice that is bringing catastrophic loss of life and human suffering to the people of Ukraine. The remarkable unity among the world's democracies led by the United States and Canada gives me great hope that once again, democracy will prevail over autocracy. Let there be no doubt, the United States and Canada are in lockstep with our allies and partners in holding Russia accountable for its horrific behavior and supporting Ukraine and its courageous citizens. As NATO allies, Canada and the United States have also both pledged to spend 2% of our GDP on defense. This investment in our armed forces and our defense architecture is critical to ensuring our collective security. As we now see in Ukraine, the security our countries enjoy is not cost-free. We need modern defenses to overcome modern security challenges. This also means making sure our armed forces have the right equipment, equipment that is fully interoperable and that we have it as expeditiously as possible. This is a NATO issue, but it is also a NORAD issue, and it is a shared priority of the United States and Canada. Finally, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau understand that our relationship is not limited only to bilateral issues. We work together on a host of priorities that are important for the people of our hemisphere and people around the world. The Summit for Democracy, the North American Leaders Summit, our mutual commitment to working together to support a more stable, democratic, and prosperous future for the people of Haiti, and our stand to end the use of arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations where Canada has led the world are just some of the examples of our joint work to build global alliances. And of course, as I mentioned, we work together at NATO and are coordinating closely with other allies and partners to support Ukraine and impose economic costs on Russia and Belarus. The United States and Canada are founding members of NATO. And even as we are talking here, Vice President Harris and Prime Minister Trudeau are meeting in Poland to discuss and reaffirm our shared commitment to collective defense and transatlantic security. Together, we are taking actions to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and to address the unfailing, the unfolding humanitarian catastrophe. So it's been quite a year. It's been quite a few months since I've been in Canada, but it's been quite a year. We've done a lot, but there's even more to do. One of my favorite Joe Biden quotes about the United States-Canada relationship is as follows. There's nothing we cannot achieve when we commit ourselves to it. And when we work together, Canada and the United States, 
as the closest of friends should, we only make each other stronger. That's what the roadmap is about. That is what the Canada-United States relationship is about. And I look, to, I look forward to working with Kirsten and to working jointly with all of our elected leaders to accomplish that vision. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to the upcoming discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador Cohen. And, and for the relative newbie on the file, that was a very impressive summary. And I think as with uh, Ambassador Hillman, you hit the tone just right. This is a very special relationship. Despite the laundry list of things we do, uh, you both are so committed to what really makes the relationship special. So I thank you for that. Um, we have time for a few questions and I, I just wanted to sort of bring us down to a couple of the issues that have been really in the headlines. Um, First, in the wake of some of the recent uh, protests in Canada related to COVID mandates, are there any strategies that the two governments have devised or could work toward uh, to avoid the risk of trade bottlenecks uh, and in the future, and also to focus on supply chain resilience, which of course was a topic in the NALS meeting, North American Leadership Summit. Ambassador Hillman, let me start with you on that and then come to Ambassador Cohen. important question and it was you know it was a it was a, a very important um moment in time when we when we saw in particular the bottlenecks at uh, windsor the windsor detroit bridge um and I, I think i'd like to answer your question in a couple of ways the first thing i'd like to say is that i do think that we have to recognize that um disruptions at our border happen from time to time right they happen they happened because of the protesters a handful of weeks ago. They happen because of natural events. They happened between BC and um, Washington state when there was flooding just this last fall. They happened obviously during 9-11 and they've happened many times in between for a variety of different reasons. Um, and whenever they happen, they underscore for those of us who spend our time thinking about this, not the fragility of this border situation, but on the contrary, the incredible importance of our ability to keep um, people and products moving between our two countries and the degree to which we are deeply integrated. Um, and that's really what I take from that situation. I, I take from it that a couple of things. One, it was a handful of, you know, I think we have 119 border crossings. So it was a handful of border crossings that were disrupted for various lengths of time, um, some longer than others, some more impactful than others. But ultimately, they were all resolved in a manner that avoided conflict, escalation, and harm, which I think is really, really important to, to underline, especially as feelings get heated around issues in, in this case, which were, you know, COVID related issues and ensuring that we, we manage these situations from a public safety perspective in a manner that keeps people safe and avoids escalation is, is always going to be a priority for Canada. At the same time, um, we want to look at what happened there and see how we can make sure that we have systems in place to react maybe more quickly uh, well, more quickly and in, in a more coordinated way with our American friends and amongst different levels of government in the US and in Canada. Um, and so we're, we're, we're looking at that, just like we, we looked at, for example, border resilience on the West Coast after the floodings, thinking, hmm, are there things that we need to be doing from an infrastructure perspective to make sure that we don't have some of these challenges should the situation ar arise again? So I'm not trying to diminish the impact in particular of the Windsor-Detroit crossing. I think it was very you know, as everyone saw, very impactful, and it was impactful for citizens on both sides of the border and businesses on both sides of the border. Um, these things happen when there's a relationship that's this deep and this interconnected, it will happen. I think it's a testament to how deep and inter interconnected and mutually supportive the relationship is and how we have to, at all times, be learning from all of our experiences as to how to manage things better should events occur that cause some disruptions. Thanks. Um, Ambassador Cohen, over to you. And as a Detroiter, I know this was really important to family out there, so uh, I'm biased, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I'll do, I, first of all, I think Kirsten sort of nailed this answer and I, I, I won't repeat what she said, uh, but I'll make three quick points, which is 
number one, I take the same overriding lesson here, which is for me, and I again, as you say, I'm the newbie, but for me, um, I take out of the out of the <clears throat> blockages and the impact of the blockages just how important and essential the integrated supply chain between Canada and the United States is and the value of that supply chain. So I, when you start with that, you then move to my second point, which is how do you work to avoid interruptions of that supply chain, whether it's from natural events or from, or from human events? Um, and you know, the Washington Bees, the flooding was a natural event, which by the way, I think demonstrated an enormous level of cooperation between the United States and, and, and BC and Canada to ameliorate and minimize the impacts of that flooding with um, almost instantaneous waiver of regulations and barriers to enable, uh, to, you know, to enable the flow of goods in, um, in untraditional ways. And the, and the answer, I mean, Kirsten highlighted what a couple of answers are, but we have a couple of working groups um, engaged on studying our supply chain and in particular focusing on how to make it more resilient. And in the wake of the trucker demonstrations, we've added a work stream to those working groups, which is a security work stream about how we make sure we secure the access across, uh, across the border. And the third thing, which is not really responsive to your question, but I can't control myself. Um, and I'm not talking to a member of the media, so it's slightly more permissible for me to say this, which is I get my back up a little bit when somebody says that the cause of this of these stoppages and of the blockades were COVID related restrictions. That may have been the spark that that lit the fire at most charitably, but I firmly believe that the causes of, of what became a movement in Canada and what has been a movement in countries all around the world was much broader and more complicated than COVID mandates. It was, this is a, this is a, a, a concern around the world of people who don't like government. They don't like big companies. They don't like being told to do anything. Um, there's a resentment, there's a fear, um, there's, an, there's, a, um, there, there, there's a dissatisfaction with, with life, there's a concern about jobs and employment, and that's what generates this unrest. And I, you know, look, I, I attended a security uh, defense conference uh, this morning um, in, in Ottawa where um, where, um, you know, where, where there were presentations made, including around the blockade. And, um, and I think, I think it was both Jody and Marta were there. I think, I think it was Jody who made the point of make no doubt those demonstrators, the predominant cause of the demonstrations in Ottawa was a desire by some to overthrow the government. I mean, that, that, is, that is what created the momentum and the movement aspects um, of that demonstration. It wasn't the COVID mandates, which again, may have been the spark that lit the fire, but I'll stand behind those COVID mandates and the lives they've saved in both Canada and the United States every day of the week. The responsibility of a government, the responsibility of Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden is to protect the people of Canada and the United States, all of them. And you have to adopt the best policies to be able to do that. And I think the COVID mandates adopted by both of those countries were spot on and saved millions of lives and have helped to bring us to the point today where both countries are opening up and opening up very substantially. 
Um, thank you, thank you, Ambassador. And and picking up on the mention you made of jobs and, and people's concern about the economy, the roadmap includes a selection of goals uh, that are around the idea of building back better, specifically in assisting groups that were disproportionately affected by the economy, as you mentioned, uh, and economic hardships from the pandemic. So what tools are both countries using to promote opportunities for job creation, but especially for women, youth, indigenous communities, and other underrepresented groups who, as you mentioned, have been disproportionately hit hard. I'm gonna to go to you, Ambassador Cohen first, and then to Ambassador Hillman. So this, as I mentioned in my remarks, this is something I've been focusing on. And so I actually have a bit of a sense of what Canada's doing. I have more of a sense of what the United States is doing. So I'll try not to step on, on Kirsten's toes and stay away from Canada, but I think the answer is that both countries um, are focusing their redevelopment efforts to make sure that SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises, are fully included in the recovery. That includes governmental financing programs, um, as I met, and it includes private sector financing programs. And as I um, and as I mentioned, there are a host of programs in the United States where the government is, is partnering with businesses to provide information about the programs that are available. Because one of, the one of the problems I hear from SMEs, and I've met with a, with a large number of SMEs now in Canada and previously had met with a large member of SMEs in the United States, is they just don't know what's available. The programs are all over the place and they're complicated. So they don't know what's available. And if they find a, a bank low interest loan program and they're sent an application and it's 38 pages long and they're a five employee restaurant, they don't even know how to fill out the application. So the provision of these mentoring and almost consulting services to help them access the available programs is just an essential part of, of lending a helping hand to get these SMEs back on their feet. And one other point is the traditional way, if you look back 15 or 20 years ago, the US Small Business Administration being the federal agency most charged with helping small businesses, the predominant form of assistance was a loan. Um, and particularly coming low interest loans with, with relatively easy eligibility so people could access those programs. Particularly in the wake of the pandemic, too many SMEs have balance sheets that are overburdened with debt. And frankly, loans may not be the right solution or the best solution today. So in the United States, um, the concept of forgivable loans was introduced and in addition, there is a very substantial public sector and private sector grant program around that's being made available to particularly minority owned SMEs. And in my conversations in Canada, um, as I said, I'm trying to gauge the interest in creating the same type of a joint venture approach from provincial governments, the national government, the private sector to put together a one-stop shop or a series of one-stop shops for SMEs to access, to get information about the programs that are available um, and to get um, mentoring assistance and pro bono consulting assistance to help them access those programs. And um, everyone I've talked to has been pretty excited. I don't get I don't, I don't get the sometimes too typical, well, that's a good idea, but there's no way we can do that. Or that's a good idea, but that's not the way we do things in Canada. Literally no one has said either one of those things to me. And so I'm optimistic that we can bring the structure of those US-based programs to Canada. 
Well, this is another way in which I'm jealous of you, Ambassador. People all the time say in response to my great think tank ideas, great idea, but it's impossible or implausible. So you're at least on the reality-based community side, which I appreciate. Um, Ambassador Hillman, how, are, how is Canada working in this same space? You know, one of the things that I, that I, I love about the Canada-US partnership that I don't know if people think about this all the time, is that many, I would say the vast majority of ways in which we interact as two countries are not on issues that folks would consider international issues, right? So um, we, of course we work together in the UN, of course we work together at NATO, of course we work together um, in partnership dealing with global issues. Of course we deal in sort of our bi bi binational and bilateral trade and regional trade and all this stuff. But we spend an awful lot of time uh, talking about our domestic policy implementation in areas where we are trying to achieve the same kinds of goals. We live in the same neighborhood. We have very similar, different, but similar pressures. We, we are deeply integrated. And therefore, when I, one country makes a policy decision, it inevitably has an impact on the other for good or ill. And so we do spend a lot of time talking about what, what most friends would consider very much domestic issues because they because what we do domestically not only impacts each other, but we also really are, are have a very vibrant um, effort to cooperate and learn and, and build together. So I say that because one, David's commentary about, about his, his ideas are, are very illustrative of that exact thing, but also when it comes to, in answering your question, promoting um, opportunities for small businesses, minority-owned businesses, um, you know, businesses that have faced uh, the, the greatest challenges from communities who are, are most challenged. There is a lot of domestic policy that's going to be involved in addressing those situations. So it is going to be tax policy, right? It's going to be childcare and early childhood education policy so that people can afford to get out into the workplace so that women in particular, but other single parents and, and those who have child rearing responsibilities can, can have a level playing field. So Canada has implemented a $10 a day daycare policy, for example, last year that is being implemented across the country. And of course, that is a, is a policy that's designed to help women, help women in the workplace, but it's an economic policy, make no mistake, right? It's an economic policy. Um, access to post-secondary education that is, you know, is, is accessible for, for people, access to financing, um, access to communities, coaching, mentorship, these kinds of things. So these are very domestic, but we can really, and we do all the time, compare notes on this with, with, with the US and try and learn with each other. And then on the international front, sort of the bilateral front, one thing that we know for sure is it's that our, our economies, both the US and the Canadian economies are largely driven by small and medium-sized enterprises. Small and medium-sized enterprises, while they are the drivers of our economy, are hugely underrepresented in trade. And trade, companies that trade, they pay more, they're more resilient, and they grow faster. And between our two countries, if a company wants to dip its toe in the trading pool, they tend to do it between Canada and the US and the US and Canada. That's where their first experience of international trade is because it doesn't really feel that much like international trade. It's just sort of selling stuff to your neighbor down the street. And so promoting SMEs in taking their first steps into Canada US trade is really a very worthwhile endeavor that pays dividends beyond um, efforts in, you know, in other areas with other partners. And it's a little easier and, and we have a very similar philosophy towards it. So, so we have international, we have, in addition to these domestic policies that our government's working on very carefully and very um, sort of deliberately in an effort to get underrepresented Canadians, not only into business, but into trade. We have uh, policies that are specifically designed for those communities to help them get access to financing, to help them get access to coaches, you know, to help them understand how to make these first steps. We have services within the government and at arm's length that coach 
um, these companies within specific marketplaces and help them get ready for that. So we're doing a lot of effort there. And as I say, I think that for every ounce of effort put in, um, we get uh, a pound of benefit back for, for, for both our economies and obviously for these individuals. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much. Chris, oh, yes, please, just, sir. Uh, so obviously, Kirsten and I have talked about this subject. Kirsten was the first person I went to to talk about my ideas. And in listening to Kirsten, you just hear that Canada and the United States, represented by the two of us, have exactly the same agenda, put the same priority on getting this right. And in listening to Kirsten's description of some of the things that are available and going on in Canada, my description of some of the things that are available and going on in the United States, this is not a case where we don't have the programs, or we don't have the ideas to support it. The issue is communication and accessibility, the knowledge of the SMEs who would be benefited from this, of what exists and how they can access it. And that's, I mean, it's it the, it's the discussions that I've had with SMEs, with Canadian businesses, with Canadian government officials, with Kirsten, that have just convinced me that, that what I'm talking about is not that heavy a lift because Canada, I don't know of anything that Canada needs to create new um, in order to accomplish the goals that Kirsten laid out. And I don't know if there's anything the United States has to create new to accomplish these goals. It's just a matter of a, of a more integrated communication plan of stitching together a, existing and available programs, promoting them and promoting their accessibility to SMEs and then, um, and then letting them work their magic as a result of spreading what is already available across a broader base of SMEs than is currently taking advantage of the programs. Well, Ambassador Cohen, I, I, I can second what you're saying. I know you've had influence on her because Ambassador Hillman spoke in terms of an ounce of effort and a pound of benefit, <laughs> not in metrics. She's, she's been converting for us all. She was courteous to do it that way because if she had done it in metrics, I'm not sure I would have understood the analogy. <laughs> I know me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we're coming very close to time. I just wanted to give each of you a chance to weigh in on, on a final thought. You both talked about uh, Russia and Ukraine, obviously the big issue of the day. I'm wondering two things in the roadmap that stand out to me. One was the commitment to a U.S.-Canada Arctic dialogue. And the Arctic Council has been suspended or put on hiatus because Russia is currently the chair. So I, I wonder how does the Arctic figure in and where do you see us going there? But also human rights, democracy, those very important principles, so important to both countries. And I know President Biden is hoping to host the second democracy summit here in Washington, or at least in the United States later this year. So could each of you, and I'll go to Ambassador Hillman first, just talk a little bit about where we go from here on Russia, Ukraine in areas like human rights and democracy, but also the Arctic. Remark, but I guess I will I will uh, try in trying to respect the timeline to maybe focus on a few things. Canada and the U.S. live in a specific neighborhood, and our neighborhood is our Arctic neighborhood. And for Canada, the Arctic is an enormously important uh, component of our national identity. Um, it is an important place where people live and and have their heritages and their, their current lives. And we need to be making sure that we are doing everything that we can to support those communities, to ensure their resilience, to protect them as, as best we can from the, the challenges that are felt from climate change most acutely uh, up there. And at the same time, it is also deeply um, uh, relevant at this moment to think about the security aspects of our, our, our shared Arctic neighborhood. So we have a, not only does Canada have an Arctic policy and the US have an Arctic policy, but we now have a bilateral Arctic dialogue that um, has been, I would say, uh, you know, the attention to which we are 
providing additional focus given geopolitical realities right now. And there is no question that security and sovereignty are essential in that conversation. And looking at the kinds of activities, investments, priorities that we need to be look, we need to be focusing on uh, is going to be a very, very, very important part of that conversation. In terms of uh, the promotion of democracy, you know, at home and and internationally, because from where I sit, we all we need to be paying attention to the institutions underpinning democracies everywhere at home and internationally. And those institutions, you know, are include respect of human rights, making sure elections are free and fair, making sure that we have a media that is vibrant and, and that there is press freedom and that people are able to access information. Watching for the, the negative effects of uh, sort of the, the flip of that of um, disinformation, right? And what 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 can we do as a community of nations to deal with some of the enormous challenges to democracy that we all face from media disinformation? So these kinds of institutions, I think, um, are an area where we need to be putting a lot of our attention, both at home and internationally. And as I said. We, Canada in particular, and Minister Jolie in particular, our foreign minister, is, is quite um, focused on media freedom, disinformation, making sure citizens have access to, to the information that they need in order to exert their rights within democratic societies or in order to express themselves if they are looking to change their societies. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Ambassador Cohen, last word to you. Unmute my microphone. There we are. So, um, in again, in respect of the time, I will try and be brief here. Um, I'll let me start with democracy, um, and I do think it, it's it's way more than an afterthought in in the roadmap. It's a central part of the shared culture between the United States and Canada to promote democracy in our countries and around the world. We were talking about the demonstrations, and um, you know the, dem the, the demonstrations pose a traditional conundrum about democratic societies, which is you need to respect free speech and the ability of people to speak out. And um, you know, free speech is easy when you agree with the speech. It gets harder when you disagree with the speech, but it's a hallmark of our societies to try and respect free speech, um, but not let it take over in an inappropriate way our society. So I am a believer um, that the best way to combat speech that you do not agree with is with more speech. Um, and that you and that, that that that's the way the best democracies in the world need to function is to overpower the speech, the hateful speech, the speech that you do not agree with, with speech touting the benefits of, of democracy and the, and the benefits of our society. And I can't think of a better partner than Canada for the United States to have in promoting more positive pro-democratic speech um, at home and around the world. And so I think I, th I think that is the, it's the only antidote that I know for hateful speech. And by the way, I've also had multiple discussions with um, Foreign Minister Jolie. I think she's exactly right about the dangers of, of disinformation because disinformation um, interferes with the movement of speech. And um, I've been I've been actually somewhat entertained, but it isn't funny to look at some of the analyses of the way Russian media is covering the 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 Russian Ukraine conflict. Of course, it's not called a war. There's no mention of an invasion. It's a tactical it's a tactical move to protect Ukrainians and to remove certain. Um, disturbing elements from Ukrainian society. 
Um, and that, I mean, that's like the classic disinformation. It's what you come to expect in a totalitarian um, country, but there's thanks to the prevalence of social media, we see, we see too much misinformation, disinformation, and it makes it more challenging to combat it. And I do think it's a significant human rights, uh, human rights related issue. So I look, I think it, there's, a, as a, there's a reason why that's an important part of the roadmap. And it's something you'll see continued focus and attention on as we move forward. Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, David Cohen, Ambassador Kirsten Hillman, for giving us an update on the roadmap. But more than that, for sharing with us your leadership and the way that you're pushing forward good things for citizens in both countries uh, through this uh, rather interesting sort of vehicle for taking a very complicated relationship and, and moving it forward on a number of fronts simultaneously. We really appreciate you coming by for this update. We'll probably ask you back in a year uh, just to give you a warning. And uh, for now, thank you for your time. Thank you for this update. And for all of those of you watching, you can tell your friends this will be available in recorded fashion in the same website. So if you if anybody missed this and you've now watched it, and you want your friends to watch it, please do send out the link. Uh, my name is Christopher Sands. I'm the director of the Canada Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center. And from here in Washington, thank you very much and have a good day. Thanks, Chris. You're very welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Chris. Oh, that was great.